Welcome to the EP Wealth Advisors Informed Investor Market Outlook. Um, my name is Breen Murphy. I'm the Director of Client Experience here at EP Wealth Advisors. Um, and I'm here to introduce your presenter for the day. Um, he's one of the members of our investment committee. And, uh, you know, if you've paid attention to any of our uh, blogs or videos, uh, he's the, the main person. Uh, this is Adam Phillips. Uh, you know, he is a chartered financial analyst. He's a certified financial planner. Uh, you may have seen him quoted in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he's also been in Market Watch, CNN, Bloomberg, um, and he's pre presented, uh, you know, for many of you as well. Um, he's got a great presentation today. So I'm going to turn it right over to Adam. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Well, thanks, Breen. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here, and, and uh, thank you for joining. Thank you uh, especially to those who uh, submitted your questions ahead of time when you, when you registered. We received about, uh, I think, a last count, a little more than 70 questions, and, and that's really helpful because it helps me, as, as I'm building out this presentation, to really hit on those topics that, uh, that you're all most interested in. And so I want to make this informative, as informative as possible. You know, I won't be able to hit on all of those questions, but I, I think there were some general themes, and I've, I'm going to try to tackle those uh, over the next 30 to 40 minutes. Um, one is, is the post-election outlook. Obviously, obviously, that's top of mind. The other is, uh, is an update on the economy, and especially as we're seeing an, uh, a new surge in the number of COVID cases around the country. Uh, and, and then uh, round it out with a uh, discussion about the current debt levels in the U.S. as well as the dollar weakness. We've seen the dollar, uh, I believe, just today it, it hit its lowest level in, in about two years. So um, no shortage of topics to discuss. I, I won't be able to hit on everything I'm sure that's on your minds, but we will do a Q&A session after this. And so uh, you can submit your questions directly to Breen, and, and so we'll have time to uh, hopefully uh, fill in those, those gaps towards the end. So with that, uh, let's get started here. So I, I thought it was best just to really start with uh, a look at performance here, um, just to uh, set the stage for this discussion. So what we're looking at here is total return performance for major asset classes. And really, total return simply means the price appreciation plus the income that's been generated in these various investments. So there's uh, there's three columns here. The one on the right is, is showing the, the year-to-date total return for these, uh, and then the middle is showing since this March 23rd low. So that, that represented the low point for the S&P 500, really when we were in the depths of, of this uh, market sell-off, uh, the, the S&P 500 declined about 34% from peak to trough. And then at, on that point, uh, on, on that date, we started this rally that we're still enjoying today. So just going down the list here, we see that the S&P 500 has rebounded more than 60% since that since that time, it's it's now up uh, on a year-to-date basis, close to 13%. These numbers are as of the close of business on Friday. And developed international markets have done quite well, also. Um, so that's think Japan and, and various parts of Europe that are developed economies. Um, they're 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 just barely positive on a year-to-date basis, but they've also seen a pretty good recovery. Emerging markets have, have held in pretty pretty good, up about 60% also since that low, up 9% year to date. And really it's the same positive story if you're looking at bonds as well. So high investment grade uh, bonds, uh, uh, high quality, you're, you're looking at taxable bonds, so corporate uh, high quality corporate bonds or treasury bonds, up close to 7% for the year. And so obviously these had the benefit of, of doing well, treasury bonds specifically, and government bonds had the benefit of doing well when we were in the in that risk off environment when when stocks were falling and they've also continued to do well since this this uh, this rally and and move towards back towards these uh, riskier parts of the market uh, started uh, and that's really because of some help from the Federal Reserve which we'll touch on later um, finally this this next line at the bottom is really just showing municipal bonds so looking at the the benchmark for national tax free bonds. So you see they've, they're lagging their taxable counterparts on a year-to-date basis up just shy of 4%. Um, but uh, since the March 23rd low, they're actually up 12%. So they've more than doubled the return of taxable bonds. And really what that tells you is that they, they suffered quite a bit in that, in that drawdown that we saw earlier in the year. And so they've made back some ground 
uh, still underperforming their taxable counterparts, but they're hanging in pretty well. So one of the questions that uh, that I, I I still get from time to time, and I, I saw it in uh, in some of the the RSVPs that we received, um, it, it's how can you justify the the move in this market? And uh, and and really, I, I, that's why I wanted to include this slide. You know, this market recovery has has been uh, one of the themes has really been narrow breadth. And when we say that, it means that there's a handful of stocks that are really uh, pulling the majority of the weight for the overall stock market. And so in this case, we're looking at the year-to-date performance uh, of the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 is shown uh, in, this, in this red line here. And so you see year-to-date up about just shy of 13%, the number that I showed on the last page. But if you look at the five biggest stocks in the S&P 500, the technology stocks, they're, they're listed here. So Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and Alphabet or Google. They're up more than 50% on a year-to-date basis. So if you were actually to strip these out and, and say, well, how did the stock market, the S&P 500, do if you excluded these names? The returns are uh, would be about 6% if you didn't have the benefit of those big five companies. Um, so it's now in positive territory, but for a while there, and for the majority of this rally that we've seen since since uh, mid-March, um, the the remaining stock market, those uh, the, the average stock, if you will, was still in negative territory and only recently went into positive territory. So it's been about narrow breadth and, and very specific areas of leadership. And so that's it, it, the similar stories being told in this chart on the right in that not every stock is enjoying a, a, a great time right now. Um, there, this is showing the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 that are a certain distance away from their 52-week high. And so the takeaway here is that close to 30% of stocks within the S&P 500 are still more than 20% below their all-time high. So even though you have a lot of these companies like the, the technology companies that we referenced on this chart on the left uh, doing quite well, there's still a lot of stocks that are still uh, trying to make their way out of a pretty deep hole. Okay, so um, moving on to uh, really the, the first main theme here is, is touching on the election. Um, you know, I, if you're like me, you wanted the election season to end quickly um, so we could rip off this Band-Aid and, and really move on with, with our lives. Um, you know, I, I don't think many of us expected that going into it, but we you know, certainly couldn't be blamed for hoping. Um, un unfortunately, in the end, we're, we're kind of left with a cliffhanger. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it kind of reminds me of of, uh, of the latest Yellowstone uh, season um, season finale. If uh, if you're like me, you've uh, been uh, you, you've been supported throughout this pandemic by by some decent TV, and, and Yellowstone is one of my recent finds. And and so that that's kind of what this uh, what this election feels like is is we're we're left in suspense. For the purpose of this presentation, we're going to assume for now that Joe Biden will be inaugurated on January twentieth. Um, I know there there are many who um, might, might think it's it's funny to have a post-election um, webinar or outlook call when when the results are, are still not final. Um, but for the purpose of this, let's just assume he does get inaugurated on January 20th. I think the real question mark is Senate leadership. Who's going to control the Senate um, following those January 5th runoff elections? Um, either way, if you assume that that Joe Biden will be inaugurated and and is the president elect, um, this makes seven federal elections in the last eight, which is shown here, in which we've seen a change in power. Um, one, one party has been removed in power. And so what we're looking at here is obviously the president, uh, the House Speaker, and the Senate Majority Leader. And so you can see here when they've actually changed, uh, shown with a, with a green check mark. Um, and and we, so we've, what this says is we've seen a lot of political volatility, um, really the, the most we've seen in more than 100 years. And so if you're like me and, and you're, you're feel like you're constantly trying to get your bearings um, on, on politics and trying to understand where policy is heading, this could be wise that that political turnover is just in uh, very, very high these days. So far, investors do seem happy with the results. And, and, and so I, I want to stress that when when we when we're going through these slides and, and when I'm talking, please know that we we do look at the investment landscape and we manage portfolios through an apolitical lens. I really do want to stress that um, we we leave our own political biases at the door when we come here. And we really want to just 
see what the impact is on the outlook for the economy and for the markets. In this case, if we look at performance following the election, we see that it's uh, that investors seem to be happy for now with the results, um, with with the prospect that Joe Biden will be the next president. Uh, <clears throat> so the in, in the that the week of this latest election, we saw the S&P 500 gain 7.3%. That was the best since 1932. So that's what this chart here is showing. Uh, note this is before the boost from uh, the, the recent positive news on the clinical trials from Pfizer and Moderna. Um, so this is really just pure um, election driven. It's not just about uh, the presidential election outcome, though. I, I do think it's, it's partially about uh, the, the Democrats perhaps underperforming in those down ballot races and, and that seeing as a being seen as a positive by many investors and that's something that we'll talk about in just a couple minutes here um, but wanted to uh, share this slide you know at the same time I think we do need to acknowledge that the, the even though investors seem to be happy with the results the nation remains divided right so um, this is a poll that was done by uh, by YouGov shortly uh, following the election and uh, the first question said, how much confidence do you have that the 2020 presidential election was held fairly? And uh, depending on, on where uh, one's political leanings were, um, it, that, that really determined the answer. So close to 80% of those who voted for Biden felt that uh, they had a great deal of, of confidence uh, that the election was held fairly. And not too surprisingly, more than 60% of Trump voters had no, zero confidence. And it's kind of the same story here on these other two, uh, two survey questions. Do you think Joe Biden legitimately won the election? Close to 100% said yes, and more than 80% of, uh, of Trump voters said no. Do you think Trump should concede the election? Close to 100% of Biden voters said, uh, said yes, and close to 80% of Trump voters said no. So we still have uh, some work to do uh, in, in bringing the, the nation together, it would appear. Now, all that being said, uh, historically, the stock market is not partisan. So what this chart is showing is the annualized, so the annual performance during presidential terms going back to 1929. So I, it's color coded. So when there's a Republican in office, it's, it's shown, the performance is shown in a, in a red, red bar. And when there's a Democrat in office, um, then, then we have a blue bar here. So the takeaway here, is that no matter whether it's a Democrat or a, or a Republican in the White House, the performance tends to be fairly strong over the course of a term. And so I think coming into the election, we had a lot of conversations about people worried about the, the short-term impact of a presidential um, election outcome. And I think this really helps to, to, um, to refine our focus and, and get us to... to uh, get us to focus in on the fact that we need to look at things over the long term and over the course of an entire presidential term performance tends to be quite strong either way. The average annual performance is 10% and performance has been positive 83% of the time. And there's uh, there's 24 instances here and it's uh, it's 20 times that performance is actually in positive territory. So I think that's the takeaway here. So there's a theme that that we we talk about uh, in in the weekly videos that that Breen and I record to give uh, just a a timely market update. One of the themes that, that we've talked about recently is that policies matter more than politics. And so it's uh, what this chart is is showing is something we're going to talk about over the next over the course of the next couple slides. But but it, it, it's it's rare for a president to start their first term without the Senate being controlled by their own party. It's even more rare for Democrats, and, and in this case, assuming that Joe Biden takes the helm on January 20th and the Republicans win one or both of the uh, runoffs in Georgia in early January, then this could be the first time that we have a, a Democratic president elected and a Republican Senate majority since 1884. So pretty, pretty interesting. You, you usually see um, the leadership uh, move in the same direction, uh, and this obviously wouldn't be the case. So that was the Senate. We're also, uh, now, now this is looking at the House seats. So with the loss of seats in the House, Joe Biden will enter the White House with a narrow mandate. So the uh, Democrats are expected to maintain control of the House, but their, their leadership is, uh, it, it has narrowed. 
um, surprisingly, um, as we've received more results from the latest election. So um, what, what, what this says is, um, is, is that the Joe Biden will enter the, uh, the White House with the weakest coattails since 1960. And really what that means is just a weak mandate. Normally you, you can rely on the support um, from from those in, uh, in 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 Congress when you when you take office as as the, as the new president uh, normally voters vote the same way in down ballot races uh, and that obviously wasn't the case this this time around uh, we we see that Joe Biden is likely the winner of the presidential election and uh, and Democrats largely underperformed in the down ballot races so that's really what this is what this is saying um, Democrats by some projections could end up uh, only controlling the House by a margin of, of about nine seats. And if that's the case, it would be the smallest majority in about 20 years. And so what does this actually mean for, for investing? Um, you know, I, I think we're all probably tired of hearing and talking about politics, but this is important from the standpoint of the, the, this, this helps to determine the path of policy going forward. And, and really what this means is that the path of policy is largely going to depend on negotiations and that Democrats really can't afford to lose support. Um, uh, so if, if Joe Biden is, uh, if, if his campaign um, initiatives were to raise taxes at the corporate level or individual level, um, it, it seems like without, uh, it, it seems like those are, are uh, likely uh, have a low probability of becoming a reality now. Even though he won, it really he really needs leadership, or excuse me, he really needs support uh, from Congress to make those reality. Even if they do, even if Democrats do win those two seats in Georgia, and they can they can rely on the vice president for that tie-breaking vote, that really means that they can't afford to lose any support from Democrats if they want to get any major legislation done. So. Uh, that means things like like taxes. If they if they are done, they likely have to be negotiated or watered down to get the support of Democratic uh, or moderate in, in the Democratic Party, uh, specifically uh, people like uh, uh, Kristen Sinema or or uh, Joe Manchin. So um, what this means for the purpose of our portfolios and our outlook is that the things that we had discussed with clients about potentially looking at those winners and losers after the election and and maybe uh, reallocating across sectors, um, we, those are less of a concern now because we don't see a whole lot of policy changes. What we are likely to see more of is, is executive orders, and that's really shown here, where you don't need the support of, of Senate. So we might see things like uh, uh, maybe some of the, the trade tariffs be removed or uh, potentially a, a ban on, on fracking. There could, there could still be some policies that are put in place to that that uh, are would be unfavorable to the energy sector or or domestic oil for instance so so there are some changes that that could become a reality but but a lot of those uh, more progressive policies that we were fearful of from an investment standpoint uh, do not appear uh, too likely right now Okay, so shifting to the economy, the, the economic recovery in the U.S. is underway. Um, so what this chart is showing is quarter over quarter annualized GDP growth. And so, so what you really see here, I think the first takeaway that, that really jumps off the charts is that we saw, we've seen really a V-shaped recovery uh, in, in terms of, of the eco uh, economic growth. We're not quite back to where we were um, in terms of the size of our economy, but we saw two two moves in quarter over quarter growth um, in excess of 30% on an annualized basis. So, so this, this move down in the second quarter in terms of uh, economic activity and the, the subsequent rebound in the last quarter were both uh, the, the largest swings that we have seen uh, in the post-World War II era. So it really just shows you how, how severe this downturn was, um, but also um, the how unique it was as well um, in that Take, uh, just turning your economy off and really flipping that light switch um, really does slam on the brakes for the economy, and that's really what we saw. So, um, the the now that we've seen this sharp rebound in the third quarter, I, I think it's more important to try to figure out where we go from here. And so, what this what we're showing here in orange is the estimates based on economist projections um, that are surveyed by Bloomberg. And so, it really just shows that we're we're not expecting another. Um, another huge rebound in growth. I think we've we've seen that initial boost 
um, that we were going to get. And so we're, we're going to see a more moderate, um, more moderate pace. Uh, over time, it's going to return to more sustainable levels of, uh, of, of quarter over quarter growth. I think the one, the, the one caveat or, or, or question mark that we're thinking about right now is our estimates for the first quarter and, and to a lesser extent, maybe the fourth quarter going to come down a little bit just because of the recent increase in, uh, in new cases we've seen nationwide. And that's really what this next slide is getting is getting at is is that with, with the uh, the elections largely behind us the dust the dust hasn't fully settled um, I'll, I'll admit but but with it now that we know uh, most of our questions have been answered with respect to the election we need to focus on the virus and ultimately when we're talking about the economic outlook and the market outlook it's really the virus that's going to dictate um, that the the growth o over the near term. So this chart is likely no uh, nothing new to, to you all. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, we've seen a huge spike in, in new cases and, and uh, around the country, and that is now putting pressure locally on uh, on the medical system. So we're seeing this again, where we're now seeing a record uh, in uh, in hospitalizations due to COVID. So this is the biggest concern here, uh, in addition to the, the increase in deaths, which which I did not show here, but has also increased because the an increase in cases is one thing, but when you when you see an increase in hospitalizations, you need to. That's when you start to worry about broader shutdowns that might be required just to uh, make sure that uh, that we don't we don't flood uh, and and overwhelm the capacity of the local healthcare systems. And so, not surprisingly, we've seen a number of of regions of the U.S. start to shut down or, or move towards shutting down again. There's no national lockdown. Um, I, I would uh, admit that that would not be well received by the markets, uh, even if it would be seen as a short-term move. Um, but um, it, I, we, I, I still think that uh, that's a low probabi probability event based on everything that I'm seeing. It, it seems that this is largely going to remain a decision that's made at the local level. So, um, but something that we are watching because it does have short-term implications. What are the ways? I, I received a question. What are the ways in, that, that we're actually tracking? Um, the the virus uh, and its impact on the economy over the short term, and that's really what this chart is addressing here. Um, it's it's this so-called high frequency data um, that that we that uh, we're we're looking at, and you know I we're, we're always looking for silver linings, especially these days. And and I could think of two um, offhand. You know, one is one is that uh, we we have access to great technology right now and uh, that this pandemic is is occurring now as opposed to 10 or even five years ago when we didn't have the luxury of of uh, FaceTime to keep in contact with our close friends and, and relatives uh, when we can't see them in person uh, can't do um, uh, virtual meetings like the one that we're doing right now and, and the second the second silver lining is that we have access to really good data um, and uh, and so this is uh, data um, that that um, reflects mobility in the form of driving, walking, and transit around the U.S. This is provided daily by Apple. Google has a similar um, uh, feature that they that they offer. But what you see is is that we saw an initial bounce here uh, as the economy economy started to come back online, and now you're seeing it fall a little bit. Um, and so, not too surprising, uh, considering that we are getting into the colder weather months, and we're seeing an uptick in the number of cases. Um, similar theme uh, really across all of these, but this is another one, open table seated diners. So um, we saw this really go to zero when we had that national, uh, really a national lockdown here in March and April. Saw this come back online and, and it's now ticked down uh, again and we're at about 50% of where we were last year. TSA traveler throughput, so how many people are going into, going through those TSA checkpoints um, and and being being able or willing to travel um, by air these days, and so this number started to rebound again. It's starting to flat uh, flat line again, um, and so that's called about 60% of last year's level. And then same story with hotel occupancy. Um, this is a weekly number that we that we have access to, um, and so you're seeing that where things had started to improve. Uh, as as you as you see the 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 surge in in virus cases continue across uh, most of the U.S., then you should expect these uh, some of these indicators to struggle. So, what about those more traditional indicators? Um, we we've been very fortunate that 
as as ugly as this uh, e economic uh, impact was was expected to be, and and uh, as weak as the recovery was expected to be, uh, considering the hole that we dug in for ourselves, uh, the, the the recovery has actually been pretty strong, but it has been uneven. So one of the the brightest spots of the economy has been housing. Uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen the stats, but but it's been largely driven by uh, by the the record low mortgage rates. Um, we can thank the Fed for a lot of that, uh, as well as a desire for many to um, to go and and uh, relocate to to buy uh, larger homes that that better suit their needs if they're working from home and want a dedicated office space, for instance, uh, or just need um, some additional breathing room um, if they felt kind of closed in uh, w with their families, um, or just more land if if they if uh, these homeowners wanted uh, wanted to. Uh, or if they wanted to get out of an apartment and, and have an actual yard where they can um, they can enjoy some space. So this is what we're showing here is monthly new home sales. So it's just one of the measures that we can track. And you see this strong um, strong rebound here in, in 2020. I show no new home sales uh, rather than the other ones. The other ones are the other pieces of data around housing are. Um, just as important, I would say, but new home sales is interesting because we, we consider it a leading indicator. It tells us where the economy might be going, and so when we see that it's strong and it's strengthening, that that to us is a is a pretty good sign. And and why is this a leading indicator? Well, the the way that to look at it is when you're when someone buys a new home, this this ultimately will lead um, presumably to furnishing that home. So so that homeowner has to go out and and buy furniture to uh, to fill that new space. It will also lead to new construction. So um, new construction is needed to replenish the, the uh, housing inventory. Uh, and uh, not too surprisingly, one of the data points we got um, uh, earlier this week was, was uh, around home builder confidence. And home builder confidence is at a record right now because there is so much demand for homes that they, there is, uh, there, there's a huge need to continue building. And, and so these things go hand in hand. So this is really a good data point and it's really helped our uh, e economy um, survive and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and it certainly aided this recovery along the way. So um, meanwhile, the other chart on the right is showing personal consumption. So this is also very important. We talk uh, a lot about how consumption uh, accounts for about two thirds of the economy. And so, Consumption has been uh, actually quite strong, um, contrary contrary to what many expected. Retail sales are up about three percent above where they were before the uh, before the the pandemic even began. Um, as part of this could be driven by uh, what they call that retail therapy, maybe. Um, you know, people just needing an excuse to to feel good and 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 spend a little bit. They can't go out and and dine uh, at the same rate. They can't travel, so they have some some extra cash to go and and spend. Uh, not surprisingly, this holiday shopping season we're entering is expected to be the best on record. Uh, expected to uh, see holiday sales rise uh, about nine percent over the prior year. So I think it's more about that retail therapy. And so, when many expected consumption to decline, it's actually held in pretty good. But there are winners and losers in this. Um, so there's been uh, so we we've seen a, a th this chart really touches on 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 one subset. So those who, um, the service in, in, industry, not surprisingly, is still about 7% below where it was. So we think about hospitality. Um, and then goods, so purchases on goods are up about 6% from where they were. So um, this really, th think about all the uh, the online shopping and how easy it is to go in and buy on, on websites like Amazon and, and, and others. And so um, you know, goods also extends to uh, to bikes and recreational equipment. That's been a that's seen a huge surge here as people are just looking for hobbies and ways to spend time outdoors while remaining socially distant. So, what this means is is that there's winners and losers here, and so those who are employed in these various areas are going to um, be in uh, in uh, in in better or worse shape uh, depending on their industry. Uh, so, so meanwhile, temporary job losses risk becoming permanent as the pandemic lingers. So, I, really, what these slides are getting at uh, is is that additional fiscal support is necessary. You know, where there was there were hope, hopes that we could get some a new fiscal package before the election. I think now we're all 
um, starting to resign ourselves to the fact that we might have to wait until uh, after this lame duck session to get some kind of fiscal support to those who need it. Um, there's uh, different uh, estimates as to where the size of that package might come in, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but, but there is certainly a need, and, and that's what these charts are, are showing, is, is that when this pandemic began, we saw that, that most of those who were being laid off um, were, they considered their layoff to be temporary. Um, they were being furloughed, or they thought that maybe this was just a short-term rough patch where their businesses uh, would have to shutter for, a short, for the short term. As time has gone on, we've actually seen this number come down and, and these individuals be reclassified to permanently unemployed. Meanwhile, we see the duration of unemployment has increased. So now 60%, about 60% of, of those who are unemployed have been unemployed for more than 15 weeks. So really what this means is, is that as time goes on, you need to worry about permanent scarring in the economy. Uh, the, the longer that, that workers are displaced, uh, the bigger the, the risk of them losing uh, skills that they, would have, uh, that they would have gained on the job or having to make a, uh, a, a shift to an entirely different uh, industry or sectors and, and really start all over. So this is something that we do need to keep an eye on going forward. I think one bright spot, though, is, uh, is accumulated savings. And, uh, and, and so the, the consumer this time around, you know, we think about it compared to the housing crisis and why we do have, uh, uh, are, are quite a bit more optimistic this time around is that consumer balance sheets are actually quite strong. This is one way that we can measure it. So personal savings rates so that the uh, amount of cash left over as a percent of uh, disposable income among the average household is about 14%. So um, since this, this pandemic began, personal savings uh, has, has grown by about Two trillion. That's what's being shown on the right here. So, as I, as I just said, that there's been winners and losers in this pandemic, and so there's many areas, uh, um, many individuals in the uh, in the U.S. that have been uh, hurting certainly, and and I want to stress that. But the average household is doing okay. Recent actions by the Federal Reserve suggest accommodative monetary policy is here to stay. So when we think about What's also been driving this rebound in stocks, we, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, we have the Federal Reserve to thank for a lot of things, including the, the low mortgage rates. And, and that's really, you can see um, some of their actions here. So this is their Federal Reserve balance sheet. They're, they are buying bonds on a monthly basis. And so the size of their balance sheet, the amount of bonds uh, that they own, has grown by close to $3 trillion since this crisis be, uh, began. So what this does is it helps to keep interest rates low because they're providing a source of demand for outstanding bonds. Meanwhile, they control short-term interest rates. And so what this is saying is, is that the Federal Reserve, uh, um, par the participants on the Federal Open Market Committee expect, and, and most investors expect, that interest rates set by the Fed will remain uh, close to zero for the next several years. And so they are trying to do whatever it takes while we're waiting for this fiscal support that I say here is likely forthcoming. Um, it's a question of do we get it in the lame duck session or sometime afterwards? I think most would, would uh, are betting that it's going to come to, uh, sometime after uh, the inauguration uh, of Joe Biden. But I'm um, just showing here the, the aid that's been provided uh, during this pandemic. So... Uh, in, in total, there's been uh, aid uh, that, that accounts for about 13% of GDP. So they've thrown a lot of money at this problem. And, uh, and there's, uh, so, so the question becomes, well, how big is the next package and, and who, does it, who does it benefit? You know, it's been seven months since Congress last passed a bill. Um, the, many believe that the next package could be around a trillion. It, it could come in lower than that, but um, for perspective, the, the House actually, when, when they passed their HEROES Act back in, in May, that was obviously, um, uh, uh, was not passed by the Senate, um, they, they, had, uh, they had passed a package for $3 trillion. So whether it's a trillion or less, it's going to be quite a bit lower than what the House was originally looking for. So what this means is that the Federal Reserve uh, just has to stick around for that much longer and, and hopefully provide this bridge uh, to buy us time. Okay, so shifting gears to to stocks. So we're so we're living through um, yet another wave of the pandemic. We know that there's there seems to be um, 
this ongoing gridlock in in Washington. So so how do we feel about stocks? It doesn't sound too good. And 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 so what I'm looking at, what I want to focus on here is the fact that stocks are forward looking, markets are forward looking. It's not just the stock market, but when we're talking about in, investing in stocks, it's so important to understand that you're not investing based on how the economy looks today. You are investing based on the outlook for the future. And so a couple ways that that we are um, that we want to uh, touch on this is 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 the fact that number one, management and and companies are becoming more optimistic about uh, their prospects for the future. And so here we're looking at the percent of S and P 500s who are issuing positive earnings guidance. And what this means is they are providing guidance for their quarterly earnings uh, announcements and saying, okay, for for the fourth quarter we expect to earn X amount. And what this is saying is that close to 70% of the time, excuse me, uh, close to 70% of these companies are providing guidance that is higher than what they had originally provided, meaning their expectations are improving for the future. And so that is is certainly, if we're focused on forward-looking data, this is certainly um, a good trend to see, especially when this rate is as high as it is compared to the long-term average of 32%. Uh, similarly, we also see uh, improving expectations for broad earnings per share, and so you want to historically you want to invest when uh, when er the expectation for is for earnings to grow. Um, that that leads to pretty good forward returns. That as as a stock investor, you are participating in in that earnings. You're investing in that earnings growth, and so seeing the outlook for earnings improve certainly uh, bodes well for the stock market going forward. So I received a question um, in, in one of the in, in, in the RSVPs. It, it said um, it was something along the lines of, "What are the odds of a significant double dip recession? Um, not a double dip, uh, or excuse me, what are the odds of a significant significant double dip um, sell off in the stock market?" It was it was specifically saying not not a double dip recession, but um, a double dip sell off like that which we uh, experienced back in February and March. And so this slide is really is really getting at that question. So this is the checklist for the end of the bull market. Um, this is a chart that we've shared in the past, and it really helps to understand where we might be in this in this current market cycle. Uh, and and specifically, it's touching on nine different indicators that um, that conditions that that existed back when the the, the market topped out uh, in in 2000 and 2007. And so we show where we are currently based on these nine indicators. And, and so, um, so we, we see right now that only one of them is, is currently being checked off, and that is increased IPO activity. So uh, IPO being initial public offering. So this, it, this is one of those that might signal a, be, be a red flag for us if we see it, and, but only one of nine conditions is not a bad thing. Uh, the, I, I should probably explain why IPO activity and increase in IPO activity might be a bad thing. So historically, if you see a lot of companies start to rush to, uh, to go uh, from being private to to uh, to public, that means that they might just be trying to sell and raise money when they think that their valuation uh, is as high uh, as it could potentially be. Um, and so that might be indicative of a market that's about to top. And so we've seen an increase in IPO activity, but importantly, we're not seeing the rest of these conditions being met. Um, we, in the weeks since the election, we've seen new flows into stock funds, uh, into stocks and equity market funds. It doesn't quite deserve a check mark yet, just because it's it's been over a relatively short period, and and we're still looking at it over the longer term, uh, several weeks and months. There's still a lot more money going into bonds than stocks, and so this is not uh, necessarily a concern for us just yet. So what matters most is time in the markets, not timing the markets. I may have shared this in the last presentation, um, but I, I wanted to bring it back because another question that I received was, is there ever a time when you would recommend exiting the market until a certain risk or event blows over? And so I thought this was a great slide to just touch on that uh, in case uh, others on this on this call um, are asking themselves the same question. So. So really the takeaway here is that if you're waiting for a perfect time to get invested, you're going to be waiting forever. There is always something that we as investors have to contend with. This chart on the left is showing 
uh, major issues that we uh, investment hurdles over the last 10 years. 2020, we we could obviously fill in the the blank here, um, but um, but but it's so important if you have a, a long term investment strategy to stick with it. You stick th with it through these uh, these various hurdles um, and and headwinds that you face as an investor. So what we see here is is the compound annual growth rate for the S and P 500 since 1995, and if an investor bought into stocks at the beginning of 1995 and remained fully invested until the end of September of this year, they would have had an annual return of about 8%. But if you had tried to time it and missed just those 10 best days, you would have had uh, a return of less than 5%. And if you missed uh, the best 20 days, it, it would have gone to less than 3% and so on. So it, this, this just tells you if, if you have a long-term strategy, it's so important to stick through it and understand that uncertainty is really just, uh, and, and volatility over, over short-term periods is really just the price of admission. Um, it's, not, uh, it's certainly not pleasant, but it's, it's so important to try to maintain that long-term perspective. And because really over the short-term, we always say short-term returns are, are extremely difficult to predict. And, and case in point, um, whether you, I, I think of so many clients that I spoke to prior to the election who were worried about a, a, a Joe Biden victory. And they said, if, if Joe Biden wins, the market's going to tank. Um, and so we know now that uh, the, the market didn't tank. In fact, it had its best week ever for an election week uh, in, in, in several decades. And, and so um, it's same, same, uh, same thing happened uh, back when, uh, back in 2016, when, when Investors were worried about uh, President Trump being elected, and and, and so uh, we know that the that the bull market continued, and and so it's so important to to not get caught up in short term headwinds um, that we face as investors. Okay, so moving on to the third theme, uh, U.S. debt. So uh, it one of the many elephants in the room is that is that uh, debt. U.S. debt has exploded. It's set to ex exceed the size of the economy um, this year for the first time since World War II. Um, so, w are we concerned, or if uh, if not, why? You know, I, I'd say that we are concerned, um, and and uh, over time, you'd like to see this corrected, uh, and it should be corrected. Um, you know, I, I think there's some who who advocate for um, for MMT, uh, which which is modern monetary theory, and it, and it basically says if you can afford to borrow it at cheap rates, um, then borrow away. Um, and it's similar to using justifying low mortgage rates to to buy a more expensive home that you otherwise couldn't afford. And I and I can see that logic, but but I think that it's it's important to realize that with a mortgage you're paying down that principal. With U.S. debt, you need to worry about rolling that debt over when, when it matures, uh, because that's historically what we do. And so right now, uh, this, this slide says that the, there, there's few signs of an imminent risk. And the reason is because we've been able to issue debt and, and, and we have an extremely uh, low, uh, low uh, average interest payment on it. Uh, so we see the average annual interest rate has, has actually fallen as our outstanding debt has exploded. This is great for now, and we likely have some time, but, but down the road, we will need to address this. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the answer for you, but I can tell you that, the, that you know, it, it likely will be things that uh, aren't too politically palatable, like, uh, like higher taxes or reduced spending. Uh, and, and so it's, it's something that uh, we do need to address down the road, but do I think it's an it's a immediate or a short or intermediate term risk? I, I, I don't think it is. And one of, the, one of the reasons why is that there is still plenty of demand for, for our debt, not just locally, but also overseas, where we see uh, the, the amount of negative yielding debt is, is now close to $16 trillion. So that's about 25% of all of global debt now has a negative yield. So that means that even though yields are really low, to us as U.S. investors, they still seem pretty good to, to people overseas who, uh, whose only option in, in their home uh, local, uh, local country is, uh, is a negative yield. And the last theme I, I did want to touch on because I did receive a lot of questions about the, uh, is, is about the dollar. So don't misinterpret a decline in the U.S. dollar as a loss of the country's reserve currency status. You know, I, I think the dollar strength is seen as a source of pride for Americans, um, but a weak dollar is actually um, 
is actually a good thing for markets and our economy. So we, we've seen the U.S. dollar, let's start for the, uh, with this slide first. We've seen the U.S. dollar appreciating since around the global financial crisis. So you see it started going up here. This is the real uh, trade weighted index. So it's weighted based on the amount of trade we do with, with other countries. This should be expected to unwind because you see over the long term, um, it, it's, it usually falls within this range. And so if you believe in a reversion to the mean, then we should expect maybe you know, 10 or 15% lower than where we are now to be closer to fair value. The other reason that I would expect it to come down is, is look at the long-term relationship between the, the dollar, which is shown in, uh, in that same blue or purple, against the, the level of our deficits. And here we're showing the twin deficits, so the budget and trade deficit, which is, uh, you know, which is approaching, uh, which is around 18% of GDP. So with our deficits expected to, to uh, get worse and, and grow larger, we would expect the dollar to decline. But, but still, a declining dollar is also, could also be seen as, as a good thing, where um, it's a case of where good news is actually um, seen as bad news by some. And, and in this case, if we see progress continue towards a vaccine and, and that alleviate pressures uh, that's currently on global economies and allow them to, to grow again, that would cause the U.S. dollar to weaken because all of a sudden global economies would be participating in growth, not just the U.S. Okay, so I'm going to touch on, on I'm going to finish off on, uh, with our positioning here. I do want to do a quick time check. So I, um, I've probably gone on a little bit longer than I wanted to, so I'm going to try to zip through these and we can hit the uh, remaining questions. But where does our uh, asset allocation stand? So here we're, we're just looking at our, our standard strategy that would generally target 50% in stocks and 50% in bonds. So we currently are neutral. Uh, in uh, on stocks, and so what that means is that we would our long-term target is 50%, and that's shown in this lighter shade of blue. And we're currently right on that target. Um, we're not overweight, um, which we would be, and we have been in the past. And we would be if we felt uh, like we wanted to step on the pedal a little bit, um, but we're not underweight either. We want to have an equal weighted exposure. Meanwhile, with, with fixed income, with bonds, we have a slight underweight here and we're using uh, various alternative investments, uh, liquid alternative investments for additional diversification um, away from uh, areas of the bond market that uh, don't offer a whole lot of yield these days. Um, on, the, on the global equity allocation, we currently have a, an overweight to US stocks over international, so uh, roughly a 75-25 split between the two um, I will say that we're warming up to some areas of the international market. We haven't chosen to add yet, but uh, we are looking and, and talking more about adding to emerging markets uh, a little bit more. Uh, really seeing the um, them navigate this uh, this crisis. It really depends where you're looking when you're talking about emerging markets. There, there's a, a lot of countries that are included there, but broadly speaking, emerging market valuations are strong. Um, they are navigating this crisis uh, relatively well compared to, uh, say, uh, areas in Europe. And they also uh, have the benefit uh, of, uh, if we see a weaker dollar, that would certainly be a, a tailwind for them. So, um, so that's uh, one of the things that we are considering. As you look to the size of the companies that we're investing in at home, so uh, we, we came into the year with an overweight to larger companies. Think those companies that you associate with every day. And we've, we've increased that overweight uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, we've gone further overweight at the expense of both mid and small, uh, small companies. Um, the types of companies we're investing in, so we're investing uh, uh, evenly. We have an equal weight between growth-oriented companies, i.e. technology and, and healthcare companies, and value-oriented companies um, when, when we bundle everything up, um, even though at the sector level, um, our biases look a little bit different, and I'll show that in the next slide. With fixed income, we we have about uh, we have an overweight um, to to what we call core fixed income, or those higher quality areas of the bond market. Or excuse me, we have we have an underweight, um, and uh, and that's about 80% versus the the target of 90%. Uh, and we have a meanwhile we have an, an overweight to strategic income. So this is an area of the bond market that can provide you with more yield, but also brings a little bit more risk with it. So think high yield or junk bonds or emerging market bonds, things like that that we're using to enhance the income of our portfolios. And then finally, uh, in, in overweight to credit or, or different types of corporate bonds that provide us with more yield, 
as opposed to government bonds, i.e. treasuries that just don't yield a whole lot in the current environment. Okay, so what we're looking at here is, is our sector allocation, which shown in the lighter shade of blue is the weighting uh, of uh, that uh, is our weighting coming into the year, and then what's shown in that darker shade is our current weighting. And so uh, you could see a, a few take takeaways here. We've added to areas uh, within healthcare, uh, added a little bit to uh, technology uh, at the expense of industrial companies. Um, but you know, the takeaway here is that we're pretty well diversified across the various areas of the market. Um, another takeaway I would say is is don't shun out of favor sectors. Um, we, we need to acknowledge that as we do start to see a light at the end of the tunnel with respect to this pandemic, and we get this progress towards a vaccine, we, we want to acknowledge that, that we could see a rotation to those less loved areas of the market before we, we get the all clear on the economy. And really what that means is, is that um, we, as we see a return towards normal, some of these areas that have really been out of favor could do quite well. So we got a little taste of that last week when, uh, when we saw started to digest some of the positive news around the, um, uh, the, the vaccine, the vaccine trials, and we saw energy companies uh, return 16% for the week and, and financial companies return 8% for the week. Um, meanwhile, the overall S&P 500 returned just 2%. So you could see these rotations, and that's why we want to maintain some allocation to each of these, even though some of them may not be as appealing as others. Um, Let's see. And, uh, you know, I, I think the last thing I would say with this is, is you know, we came into this pre-election. We were talking a lot about um, focusing on the election outcome and, and depending on the results, we would focus on the winners and losers and make changes as needed. But I would say now, knowing what we know, because the Democrats underperformed in the down ballot races, most of the changes that we're going to be making from here on out are less likely to be in response to potential policy changes and, and more uh, driven by what's going on in the broad economic environment. And so that's really what we're going to focus on going forward, more related to COVID over the short term. Obviously, fiscal support, uh, to the extent we get it, will be seen as supportive. But uh, even without it, as I showed, um, companies, broadly speaking, are, are, uh, are enjoying um, uh, an improving backdrop. And we see that in, in the revision the upward uh, revision in earnings estimates. And so I think that sets up well for the stock market as a whole. Um, with that, I'm, I'm going to pause and, and pass it back to you, Breen, um, for uh, any questions that you may have received. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, you know, there's a quite a few questions. So uh, for those of you, if you don't get your question asked, please feel free to reach out to your EP Wealth Advisor. Um, but I want to want to get into some of those questions uh, right away. So Adam, um, the first question is, what is the outlook for energy stocks in a Biden administration, and how might this impact the overall stock market? Sure. So I, I think the, the biggest thing, so if we if we go back to, uh, to the slide I, I mentioned um, where President, uh, a, a, a President Biden might be stuck uh, with a lot of um, using a lot of uh, his his uh, executive actions to get to get changes done um, if, if he doesn't have the support in Congress. And so one of the things he can still do is uh, is ban drilling, something you talked about on the campaign trail. So obviously that that wouldn't be seen uh, favorably by the stock market, but in or by energy stocks. But really important to remember that when we're talking about energy stocks they only account for they account for less than two percent of the stock market now mm -hmm. uh, just uh, you know but around the time of the financial crisis they were more than ten percent of the stock market so they could really move the needle um, but these days they account for less than two percent their earnings as a as a representation of total earnings for the stock market is even less than that amount um, so it's really not going to have a huge impact broadly speaking you know, and even if we do see some policy changes from a Biden administration, I would say that energy is more likely to be driven by uh, by global prospects for economic growth. You know, there's there we need to think about global demand, um, you know, it, just as much as we think about local production. Okay, Adam. So one of the things that you highlighted in there relates to another question that came over, which is, uh, you know, like what is going to happen, um, you know, in like with Congress. And so there was a question about. 
um, that difference between legislation if you need 60 votes and that reconciliation needing 50 votes. And I just want, was hoping you could elaborate there. Sure. So, you know, a, a lot of changes, a, a lot of what's been done recently, well, we, we think, you know, executive action doesn't need any congressional support. Um, but um, major, you know, major changes that, that we've seen uh, have required support in the Senate. Um, and, and you need uh, 50 plus votes. You need the, the simple majority to get things done. Things like tax reform. Um, and, and so th that is really what that slide is, is talking about and, and why it's less likely now um, you know, to, to uh, and, and, and it, when we think about legislative where you actually need more than, uh, uh, than, a, than a simple majority, you need a super majority, which is defined by many as, as 60 votes. That's obviously out the window um, with a lot of things, but that's where you can really make some additional changes. Um, and so that's what that slide is talking about. But really, knowing what we know now, and, and, and there's, there's been talk about, well, what, how, will, how, will president, uh, how will a President Biden fill his cabinet? Um, will a more progressive, um, uh, a, a more progressive individual like an Elizabeth Warren uh, fill that uh, cabinet position of Treasury Secretary? There's been talk about that. Uh, for quite some time, and that's that's made a lot of people nervous. But you know, this it, it all comes down to I think a lot of it comes down to January 5th and what happens there. But even if Democrats win both of those seats and they're tied at 50-50 um, in uh, uh, in in the amount of seats in in the Senate, then they really can't allude to, uh, afford to lose any seats. And so I think that the prospect of someone like Elizabeth Warren getting in and and maybe making some some changes herself um, or increasing regulations on banks is unlikely because she would actually be replaced by the Republican uh, governor there who, who can actually appoint her interim re replacement. And so they can't afford to lose any seats. And I think that's really why we're really focusing on that, that right-hand call in the executive action. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so so okay. going into the markets, there's a, there's a couple questions here uh, on sectors or, or even individual stocks. So, um, you know, there is this one question as you were talking about, you know, focusing on healthcare sectors. Um, you know, one person is is questioning about, you know, many areas of the healthcare system are hurting, like, you know, dental, general practitioners. Um, so they're curious about what sectors of healthcare are you, are you focusing on and the rest of the investment committee? Yeah, sure. So uh, we're, we're focusing a lot on, uh, on, on, I would say, pharmaceutical uh, these days is where a lot of our um, our, our focus has been, we try to stay relatively, uh, you know, diversified, even within the space. It's part of our discipline. So, you know, I showed that slide, uh, showed this slide here, um, the healthcare that, that we've increased our allocation there. So we actually have an overweight to healthcare stocks at 18.5% versus what the S&P 500 index would have. Mm -hmm. um, but even beyond that, you're not just focused on, on just one area. We try to really touch on all of those industries, but I would say that, that, um, you know, one of the areas that we are focused on is is pharma. Um, you know, there, there's the risk of of, of uh, higher drug pricing, and that I think that's been a risk. But a, a lot of it, especially in this environment, it, it seems like um, many people are actually rooting for those types of healthcare companies when they've been the enemy of, uh, more recently. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's it's more about that broad sentiment and support uh, among investors for those stocks. Okay, uh, so. Shifting gears, but still staying, you know, in the individual stock market. So we have a question here that's on, um, you know, what does it mean when companies like Amazon um, are selling off their own stock? And I think that's in reference to to Jeff Bezos uh, recently selling, um, you know, hit like some of his stock. Uh, sure. Well, uh, you know, generally speaking, it's it's something that that uh, we watch whether it's it's insider tra transactions like a Jeff Bezos, like an executive who is who is selling off shares, and they can do it for a number of reasons. It could be around what they generally say is it's a, it's because of estate planning. They're trying to they're either you know maybe gifting or they're trying mm -hmm. to diversify. What or have his you? divorce? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, you know, but so, so I would say that we generally watch because if if insiders are selling, then you you start to ask yourself, are they selling because they feel that the stock is is overpriced, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think a similar message can sometimes be be uh, construed when you when you see 
companies issuing stock as well. I, I think broadly speaking, when you see companies issuing stock, it, it really gets down to the, the cost of capital and, and, and what their preference is. Are they going to issue stock because their stock price is favorable? I, I mean, they're generally going to do that. They're not going to do it when their stock is, is selling for cheap because they don't necessarily want to give shares away. Um, but uh, if they, if they want to do that as opposed to levering up, um, you know, and, and, and taking, taking out debt, then, then that's, you'll see them make that choice. You know, these days, I would say, broadly speaking, we've seen more companies actually take on debt than, than sell stock just because interest rates are so low and it is such a favorable time if you're, if you're trying to issue. Okay. Um, you know, I know it's, it's one o'clock, so um, I, I feel like we should probably answer just a couple more questions and let people go. Um, you know, so this one is about the stability of the municipal bond market, you know, and, and what that's going to be like in a long recession scenario versus a shorter recession. And even more, um, the question is, are cities and states um, in danger of defaulting on their bonds? Mm, okay, yeah, good question. And as you as you were um, reading that one, I realized that I, you know, that's one area that I don't really touch on. I touched on the the broad municipal market returns uh, in the very beginning of the presentation, but but that's about it. So, you know, what I would say for municipal bonds is that not all not all munis are created equal. It, it's it's so important to to understand that. If we're, I would say that yeah, generally speaking, municipal uh, bonds and issuers have have had a tough go in this pandemic. It's it's really this one type of uh, environment that's uh, where you see risk off behavior that actually impacts a uh, high quality asset like munis, uh, and that's because they depend on cash flows from various activities, from from taxes, from um, from transportation. So it really depends where you look, Breen. I would mm -hmm. say that. Um, Number one, they, they do need help. Uh, they do need some fiscal support, probably not as much as, as we originally expected. You know, the Wall Street Journal, it was yesterday or Monday, had an interesting article, and it talked about how revenues for states uh, is actually quite a bit higher than, than uh, anticipated. Um, they're coming in mm -hmm. a lot higher. Um, you know, California's tax revenue was about 20% uh, higher than it was uh, projected to be uh, with personal income and sales tax revenues up. So that was really strong. Um, you're seeing sales tax has taken a hit, but not as much as, as you'd think, you know, just because consumption has remained so strong. So I would say that at the, at the high level, um, states are in relatively good shape. It obviously depends which state you're looking at. Um, some cities, um, those lower quality cities that were low quality before this are going to be pressured. Um, and, and some new areas, um, you know, are, are as well. So when it comes to us and, and what, how we invest in munis, we're focused on quality. We're not going for, for you know, high yield there, and I, and I want to stress that. Um, we've been reviewing our, our portfolios where we own individual municipal bonds and, and trying to um, just do research on the underlying credit quality. So we've been reducing or keeping an eye on exposure to, to transportation, uh, to the transportation sector. For example, um, areas like, like airports, small airports, or for-profit hospitals, or um, uh, even even uh, New York MTA, which is a huge, uh, you know, the public transit authority, um, but they're they're having a tough time. I, I think I saw a, a, a research piece that said they don't expect uh, to get to 80 percent, um, reach 80 percent level of uh, passenger traffic, um, pre-pandemic level, um, un until about 2024. So some of these areas are going to be impacted for quite some time. So it's about focusing on quality there and knowing what you own. But generally speaking, we're focused, uh, you know, we're focusing on quality and avoiding those, those areas that we think might have some risk. Okay. Okay. So let's stick on debt, right? So with debt levels increasing, um, when will inflation hit and how bad will it be when it does? Hmm. Um, when will inflation hit is, is a really Good question, and it's a tough one to answer. I would say that we track that. You know, we try to track it pretty closely. If you look at broad inflation, so the measure of inflation that's reported, um, you know, say in the PCI or excuse me, in, in, in the CPI or the PCE um, that, that that the Federal Reserve tracks, that's it's it's looking at a basket of goods. But I think many people on this call, if I said that this is tracking, you know, say at one percent, or they're trying to target two percent. Many people on this call might say, well, it seems like my costs are going up a lot, a lot faster than that. And so I want to be careful here. Um, but, but I would say that 
the, the main risk is that with all the money that's been thrown, injected into the economy, that it will at some point be inflationary. We don't see that as an imminent risk. And the reason is because there's so much money still sitting on the sidelines. Um, you know, that money is not actually moving across the economy and, and leading to higher demand for, um, for goods and services that would allow prices to, to say, go up. Um, now, that being said, I, I think at some point we will see a return to inflation. And uh, as the economy strengthens, we, we should expect the, the, uh, the rate of inflation to increase as well. But here's what I will say. I don't worry about runaway inflation. And I will say that inflation is, is preferable to deflation, to falling prices. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Fed has been trying to avoid. And, and the reason is quite simply that the Fed has a way of fighting inflation. They can raise interest rates, and they certainly have room to do that. They, it's very, very, very hard to, uh, there's no real playbook to fight deflation. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so it's switching asset classes. Um, this is a sort of a two-part question. What is the outlook for gold, and can I expect my advisor or manager to change investments proactively? Oh, okay. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, we, we, we view as, uh, gold as an, as an attractive investment, I would, I would say. You know, we, within, within this alternative, uh, alternatives allocation, we have an allocation to, to a broad commodities fund. So we, we like commodities, we, we like, uh, it, and that includes gold, but the way that we prefer to get uh, exposure to those types of precious metals is through a fund that can diversify a little bit more. You know, gold is often thought of as a good inflation hedge, um, but I would say uh, if you look at its historical performance, it has kind of a mixed record. Um, I would say that that the outlook for gold is still is still favorable, just because um, you don't have to worry uh, you don't have to worry about not receiving any income on that investment when 16 trillion is uh, of debt across the across the world is is offering a negative yield. Uh, all of a sudden, you don't feel like you're sacrificing too much by owning gold, and obviously, we're going to be in this period of uncertainty for a while. So I do think the outlook for gold is strong, but I would say that at the same time, we don't want to go overboard on a gold allocation just because we have to remember that it's hard to value these types of investments that don't have uh, any earnings or, or cash flow, right? So in, in the case of gold, you know, I always say that gold is, the beauty of gold is in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, and, and so it's very tough to value them. As far as, um, I think the second question was, can I expect my advisor to, to change the investments proactively? Uh, yes. <laughs> so um, we, uh, our investment committee, for those that don't know, we, we meet on a weekly basis. We discuss strategy and allocation. Uh, and for the majority, the vast majority of our accounts, which are discretionary, those changes are made uh, proactively. Um, and so if, if there are changes made at, uh, to the overall strategy, they will be implemented automatically to uh, client portfolios. Okay. All right, Adam. Um, so the last question here, um, for all those people, if you do, if your question wasn't answered, please, um, you know, feel free to ask your EP Wealth Advisor. Um, so the last question is, what advice can you offer retirees that don't have the gift of time to recover? What specific and proactive steps can be taken? Uh, so yeah, good question. Um, and I receive this one from time to time. It, it's difficult because there's no one size fits all strategy for, uh, for retirees. I, I think that's just the, you know, the, the reality. Um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to one's age, um, it, it really is just a just a number, um, right? And so in this case, I would say that what it comes down to is making sure that you have the right asset allocation. Um, some retirees can can afford to have a a, a more growth oriented asset allocation, and and some can't. And so in this case, I would say the the best advice I can give is to speak to your advisor and and get a financial plan done, um, so that you can determine. Um, your, your actual ability to tolerate uh, portfolio volatility and fluctuations in the market, you know, which is very different than, than your own willingness or risk tolerance. So I, I think it all comes back to financial planning and trying to inform uh, what, what that asset allocation should actually be. Okay. All right. Well, Adam, um, thank you so much for your time and insight. Um, you know, we really appreciate all the work that you've put into this. Um, so the, the, the thing I'll say for everybody here, if you have more questions, again, feel free to reach out to your EP Wealth Advisor. They're gonna be happy to answer them. Um, also, 
uh, Adam and I have a less formal interview series uh, that comes out on Wednesdays. Um, it's our informed investor market update, just talking about the latest news. It, we try to have it 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so if there are any other questions, we'll try to gear towards uh, those interviews as well. And you su can subscribe to our blog to get those. Um, Adam, do you have any last parting thoughts? Uh, I think I've said a mouthful and then some, Breen. So, uh, uh, but I, I, I do appreciate uh, everyone joining us today. I, I really uh, enjoy these, and it's a good way for, for us to stay in touch with you when we're not able to see each other in person. So thanks to everyone for joining, and, and thanks for sending the questions along. Hopefully this was helpful. All right. Everyone, thank you so much. Um, we hope you have a phenomenal Thanksgiving and holiday season. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you trusting us with, with your investments and your financial plan. And uh, we hope you have a great day.